Hello comrades, and welcome to the channel about Soviet reliability, where we are building distributed systems in Go, and sometimes talk about other things. In this episode I would like to talk about what made Nginx so popular, and why it is a great product in my opinion. And of course, it is very important that Nginx was written by our comrade Igor Vladimirovich Sosoyev. Igor Sosoyev was born in USSR, so he is definitely our comrade. Igor worked in a company that is called Rambler, it was a huge web search giant in Russia in 2000s, because it was huge, it needed a very good web server. So during his employment at Rambler, Igor developed his web server that he called Nginx during his spare time and probably during his work at Rambler as well. So let us talk a little bit about the Apache server. So one of the most popular web servers at that time, and it is still very popular today, was Apache. Apache web server appeared around 1998, and at that time it was a very good server. And it still is. For a very long time there were two very versions of Apache that were popular, Apache 1 and Apache 2. Apache 1 was a simpler concept, it did the following thing. Imagine that you have a web request, a web request coming into your server, so this will be our Apache server, so, so in most Unix systems it is a very good idea to just fork your process uh, when you receive your request and have uh, like another process that will be exactly the same. So we will call this the primary and this will be the child. So you do all the processing in the child for that connection and you die. So using this approach you can process several connections at a time and they will all lead to your process ending afterwards. So the Apache memory model was also very simple. You allocate everything and don't ever free it because your process will die in the end. So there were a couple improvements that were made in the process, so for example you can reuse this worker and handle the next connections several times, and you can use your own function to allocate memory, and you just free everything at once in the end of the request. So this allows for better efficiency because you don't have to fork every time. So the issue with this approach is that you can send the results while you are computing them, so your connection logic and your business logic live inside the same request, and you handle the cl client connection and write everything there until you close the connection or until the request finished. So what it leads to is usually that those workers can consume like 10 to hundreds of megabytes. And this was a problem for Rambler, and for probably other companies as well that want to handle a lot of connections. Also if they have very simple logic on the server could be for example I don't know, 100 milliseconds, and the download time back then. This was 2000s, so the internet wasn't very fast, so it could take like 20 seconds. So for 20 seconds you consume all the memory there. And this was not very great. This idea didn't work on Windows very well, because it doesn't have a fork system call. So the Apache 2 that uh, appeared uh, around 2002 actually solved a lot of problems that Apache 1 had, especially on Windows, but it was still consuming a lot more memory than you should. So Apache 1 and 2 were very simple and reliable, and were very easy to extend, this was a very good thing back then, and it still is today. So basically Apache consumed a lot of memory, and it wasted a lot of memory, because of the way it operates, so even though it was simple, it wasn't good enough. So this led to development of alternative web servers such as Nginx and LightHttpd. And of course you never heard of LightHttpd probably, and that is because Nginx is much better. I actually don't know why it is much better, you have to believe in the party and the system, comrades. Nginx architecture was designed to be as efficient as possible, and it turns out that it also was pretty simple, although it wasn't as simple as Apache. So what is the Nginx architecture? Instead of forking per request, Nginx actually uses fixed number of workers, and when it receives a new request, it gives the request to some worker. In Nginx architecture, multiple requests could be processed by a single worker. It does it by using the event loop. When the master process receives the connection, it actually transfers it to the worker, and then each worker actually registers that connection in kernel using the API that is called ePoll or KQ. KQ stands for kernel Q in FreeBSD. So each worker registers uh, this connection with the kernel API that tells the kernel to notify 
the worker process about the changes that happen in this connection. Every worker actually sits in a loop that asks the kernel about whether or not there are new events, and if there are no new events, then it just waits until something happens. So this thing is called event loop, and it is much more efficient when you want to handle a lot of connections instead of the Apache model, because you don't have to create as many processes as you have connections, and you only have to have very few processes, and let the kernel handle the connection and what happens there on its own. One of the complications in Nginx code is that you need to manage buffers for each connection and for each request separately, and you need to free the buffers as soon as you don't need them to save memory. So one very common use case is that you put Nginx behind Apache, then Apache does some work, it returns it to the Nginx, then the Apache worker can free its resources at this point, and Nginx will actually send the results to the user. So it allows you to save memory and resources using this way. So you can have a somewhat simple web server that can do the connection handling and request processing very efficiently, and the another server that is smart and that can do the heavy lifting. So what is good about Nginx? It is actually still pretty simple, and if you don't believe me, let me show you. So I check out the first commit in Nginx repository, and it has 3000 lines of code. But of course you might say that of course it has very few lines of code, because it is the first commit. So let me show you the first actually public version, and don't think that it is an unstable version, it is actually a version that uh, was already widely used by many people in production. The first public version of Nginx only has 50,000 lines of code, and if you try to build it, there is no configure script, comrades. There is an auto slash configure. Don't worry, comrades, this is not actually autoconf. It is a much simpler system that only does what we need. So you can see how fast it actually works. If we launch auto configure, it will work in like, I don't know, 4 seconds, and then we can build our Nginx, and it actually doesn't build, uh, because it is too old. And let us uh, actually update to the latest version of Nginx, to the current one, and uh, see how much code is it there. Even though several years have passed, and the first version of Nginx was released in 2004, and today is 2020, there are still 200,000 lines of code, so it is just four times as big as it was when it was released. And it still hasn't, doesn't have a configure script, so it has its own very simple after configure. Of course it became a little bit bigger, but uh, don't worry comrades, it's still pretty fast. So uh, it creates the make file for like seven seconds, and then you call make to compile it, and I have four cores on my machine, so I specified that we need to use five cores, so that one goes for input-output, and you can build it in 10 seconds, comrades, and rebuild it in no time at all. So it is very small, very simple web server, actually. So, comrades, this is why I say that uh, Nginx is actually pretty simple, is because it is pretty small, and it also doesn't use some stupid dependencies like auto tools. Whatever capitalist pig wrote auto tools and those slash configure scripts that everyone else uses needs to see what Nginx does, and stop doing this shit that they do. So what are the Nginx downsides? So First of all, as I said, it uses its own buffer system that is hard to write extensions for. Also, it is written in C, and you share the same worker process for several connections, so any memory issues that are very easy to actually make in C, they will result into the, the whole worker crashing, a lot of connections will be lost. Also, one other thing that Nginx didn't do very well in the beginning was that it was actually designed for FreeBSD and not for Linux. It was because Rambler used to use FreeBSD back then. And the thing is that uh, Linux has very terrible file API, even to this day, the file API that Linux provides is blocking by default. So if you are reading files in the event loop, and that was what Nginx was doing, if you have to read it from disk, everyone will have to wait. But in FreeBSD there was no such problem, and FreeBSD supported asynchronous file notifications for a very long time. And of course, any video would not be complete without talking about Go. So in Go you basically get the best of both worlds. So under the hood, the Go network code actually uses the same APIs that the Nginx does for network. So it does also use the event loop system, 
And it's pretty efficient and can handle thousands and uh, even millions of connections if you're lucky without many issues. But what uh, Go is doing differently from Nginx is that it hides this API from you. And it actually exposes the API that is similar to what you are used to in, for example, Apache, which is blocking system calls and you can write and read from network and from files and don't worry about blocking the entire event loop this way. In some sense, Go is actually better than Nginx and Apache and indeed there are some web servers that are written in Go that are becoming increasingly popular these days. But it will have to wait until its own video. So thank you very much for watching comrades and see you next week.